again, I'd like to introduce myself for, uh, for those that have just joined. Uh, I'm the product manager for the Focus Group. Um, if you have any uh, questions also after the session to me, then uh, you, can, you can feel free to contact me about this product or, or any other product that we have. Okay, so this is the, uh, the content of today's session. Uh, I'll start off uh, with a quick introduction of the devices themselves. Uh, we have two at the moment, uh, one which is already released and one which will be released in uh, about one or two months' time, so uh, quite, quite soon. Uh, then we have five use case ideas, so five different ways that you can use this product for various scenarios that you might encounter with your customers. We have a, uh, a list of special features, so those include some features which you may not find on, on other inverters of this type or which are you know, very specific uh, to this device and, and that will just help you understand the any grid a little bit better. Then we have the benefits of this uh, compared to, for example, a traditional setup of having an inverter and a charge controller separate from each other on an off-grid system or yeah, some, some other benefits as well. Uh, then I'll look at the extensibility uh, because with these devices we can uh, cater to anything from 3 kilowatts to about 45 kilowatts because you can uh, hook many of these together. Also I'll focus on that in the extensibility section. And uh, I would consider those first five sections up to extensibility as being relevant for salespeople and uh, generally for anybody who wants to get a rough overview of the device. And then the last two sections regarding system sizing, grounding, and surge protection, those will have to be a little bit more technical. I can't get around that. So let's get started with the introduction. Uh, we call this the AnyGrid Hybrid Inverter Charger. That's the full name of the device. And uh, I'd like to take a moment to just explain to you what we mean by AnyGrid and why we've uh, used this term for this family of devices. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with the terms on-grid and off-grid. Uh, of course, on-grid refers to typically grid injection uh, inverters, which are there to primarily produce PV uh, power and to either use it directly in your home uh, or to sell all or some of it to the grid. So this typically means that you need to open a contract with your, your grid operator to be able to sell that energy and then in return, of course, to get money for the amount of energy that you inject into the grid. So uh, anytime you're, you're working, let's say, grid interactively, so this is uh, parallel to the grid, that's when we consider that to be on-grid. Uh, so for off-grid, we can have uh, really completely isolated systems which have no, uh, no point at all where they touch uh, with, with an existing public grid. So they could be in the middle of nowhere, they could be uh, voluntarily off-grid uh, by people that are just not willing to connect to the grid or it might be too expensive to do so, etc. So off-grid can be anything from uh, you know, uh, a small hut in the middle of nowhere uh, to, to cottages, to, uh, yeah, to homes where it's just not uh, economically feasible to connect them to the grid, or even just for people that, that are, uh, from, from a, an environmental perspective, not willing to to hook up to the mains, basically. So AnyGrid, uh, we, we're using this term to, to combine the on-grid and off-grid, and also to have the various uh, intermediate scenarios in between. So uh, here I, I have a list of, the, of some of the different things that come to mind with AnyGrid. So one of them would be uh, unreliable grids, for example. In many countries, we have load shedding, where there's either uh, controlled or uncontrolled uh, power outages, basically. Controlled in the sense that there might just not be enough power on the grid to go around for everyone. So um, different parts of a, a city or a town might have their power cut off temporarily to save power so that there's enough to go around. So this is something that you might know ahead of time. You may know that uh, every day or uh, maybe a day a week that for a certain number of hours you're, you're going to face a, a grid blackout. So in, in that kind of a scenario, uh, something like the Indigrid will really help you out because it's essentially an uninterrupted power supply with a, a whole bunch of other uh, features you'll see later on. Then we can have uh, a regular or sporadic uh, blackout, so that sort of overlaps with the, with the unreliable grids, although unreliable grid could also mean that you might have large swings in voltage or frequency where you just, you just need to disconnect to protect your, your electronics, your loads uh, from, from facing that. 
then we have voluntary disconnection from the grid. So uh, this is again for, for people that, uh, depending on, on the, the country and the legislation, uh, it may or may not be uh, possible to, to uh, basically run an uninterruptible power supply to power your loads. But in this case, to add some PV on top of that. So like that, you're, you're basically using your PV energy when you can. And in that case, you can be completely isolated from the grid. So there's zero risk of injecting into the grid, for example, if you're not allowed to do so, or if you don't have a, a contract that you've signed with, with your power company. And you can still make, uh, make use of that, that benefit of PV power to bring down your power bill. So that's what I, I refer to as, as voluntary disconnection, where the grid is, is existing and, and stable, but you're just disconnecting in order to use your own PV power. Then we might have different types of AC generators. So this could be, you know, gen sets of any kind, diesel, gasoline, could be a fuel cell, et cetera, where typically those energy sources are more expensive than, than PV, especially obviously once the investment has been made. Um, so you want to have those as like a backup energy source, but you don't necessarily want to have them running all the time. Because as you probably know, uh, having a, a diesel or a gasoline generator running all the time at a very small load, like maybe at five or ten percent, it's like idling your car. You're basically just wasting fuel most of the time. So it's much more interesting to just activate the uh, the generator when you really need it, to then use that to charge your batteries and then to switch it off again, so that you're using it in a, in a much more fuel efficient way. Then we have uh, taking advantage of changing power grid tariffs throughout the day. So depending again on your country or region, you might have different uh, energy uh, power tariffs for day and night. So power might be uh, cheaper uh, during uh, the midday hours, for example, uh, than the rest of the time. Some, some countries will do that to, uh, to avoid excess energy in the grid and to put a premium on, on power when people use it most. So you can take advantage of uh, those price differences. And then, of course, if you're uh, allowed to, if it's legal in your region, uh, you can also use this device to feed uh, power into the grid to sell excess energy you may have. So let's get started with uh, some of the basic uh, specifications of the flagship device, which is uh, the 5 kilowatt, 230 volt AC, 48 volt battery device. So you can see at the, at the top here, we have the name PSW stands for pure sine wave, H for hybrid, 5KW for the kilowatt rating, the power output, 230 for the AC voltage, so that's your AC output voltage, and finally the 48V, that's your battery voltage. So you'll see in a moment that we also have a, a second model and you'll see that there's some slight differences in that. So I'll start off with the first point, which is we have a five kilowatt nominal power rating. So you can use any types of loads. They can be resistive, inductive, uh, et cetera, um, up to five kilowatts. Of course, if you're using things like large motors or, or different uh, types of loads, which are not uh, resistive, then you need to take into account your power factor. So typically what you do is, uh, for example, uh, let's say you have a, a one kilowatt inductive load with a power factor of 0 0.8. Well, then you simply divide uh, 1,000 watts by 0 0.8, and uh, that gives you a 1,250 watts. So that's the rating you should be using. So you always divide by your power factor to, to get the correct inverter size for your loads. So here we can handle uh, five kilowatts. Um, and we have a surge rating up to 10 kilowatts. So it means that uh, even if you have difficult loads which take a, a large surge to start up, uh, you have several seconds time with, with twice the, uh, the nominal power to, to get those units started up. We have a programmable 220 to 200 volt AC output. So you can select 220, 230, 240 as the output, and you can select uh, 50 or 60 hertz as the uh, output uh, frequency. We can use all types of 48 volt uh, lead based batteries, so gel batteries, AGM, uh, liquid electrolyte, tubular, whatever, and uh, lithium iron phosphate. You could theoretically also use other uh, lithium chemistries as long as your, uh, your nominal voltage and your minimum and maximum voltage are within the limits of the any grid inverter. Uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, the manual, for example, uh, you'll also see that we have things like equalization charge to, to give the best possible treatment to your lead batteries. So that's something you would typically not require for lithium. We have an 80 amp MPBT, which is integrated in the unit. 
with uh, up to 450 volt uh, tolerance of voltage from your PV side. So we have a very high maximum uh, PV voltage for, uh, for this type of inverter. We also have an 80 amp AC charger. So of course this 80 amp is battery side. So you can use the grid or any other AC energy source to, uh, to charge your battery. Then we have uh, various communication methods. Uh, you can see that on the bottom here, uh, we have this rectangular uh, display unit, and this includes both the display unit itself as well as the communication ports on the bottom. So this whole section is removable, and it's connected to the main inverter by uh, just a standard Ethernet cable that you would find in pretty much almost every supermarket, but at least every uh, hardware store or electronics market. Um, so there's no special requirements for that cable. And you can use that to, uh, to hook up the display in a different room, for example, to the inverter unit. So you might have a, a cottage, uh, for example, uh, where you go on vacation, and the inverter might be in a separate room uh, connected to your batteries, and you want to see the, the battery level and, and all of the parameters from your living room, and like that, you can just uh, pull a cable between the two. Otherwise, uh, in the unit, in the display unit, we also have uh, Bluetooth Low Energy, so BLE, uh, you can hook up to that, you'll see later, with an app. Uh, so you also, like maybe if you're a little bit further away or you don't want to pull a cable, you can use the, the Bluetooth app as well. We have USB OTG um, as a method for you to, uh, to upload um, battery parameters or to download uh, the data logger, for example, because there's an integrated data logger. We have RS-485 communication, CAN bus, and RS-232, uh, primarily for communication with lithium batteries, for example. And then we have a relay to start uh, generator. When you have uh, low battery voltage, for example, you can automatically start your generator. Then we have that integrated data logger for up to 60 days of data. We have a very short 10 millisecond switchover time between grid and off-grid modes. So this is uh, almost standard for UPS. It's actually a good standard uh, because if you look at most power supplies for computers, for example, uh, they can handle up to 50 milliseconds typically. So we have a much shorter switch over time here between a grid mode and off-grid mode. Then we have an IP21 rating in, uh, in terms of the, the environmental rating. So this is an indoor device. Uh, and it does have, you can see on the top here, and you'll see a more detailed picture later, uh, it does have a washable dust filters on the left and right as well. So you can just wash those out and uh, conformal coating on the PCB assemblies. We have a galvanic isolation between the battery and the inverter unit. So this means you can ground the battery, positive or negative if you like, uh, whichever way uh, you, you desire. And then finally, we have the grid feed-in mode and the battery-free modes as uh, special modes I'll, I'll explain later on. So next to this uh, flagship device, we have a, a smaller brother or sister which uh, has three kilowatts as a power output rating. It's also a 230 volt AC device, and uh, it's designed for operating with 24 volt batteries. So we have half the battery voltage and a little bit more than half of the uh, AC output power. Uh, all of the other features you've just seen or heard of, uh, and that I'll explain that later on, are identical between these two models. Uh, I know that there's a lot of people which are signed on from, uh, from the Americas, so a lot of you will have 120 volts as a grid voltage. Uh, so for you, uh, you'll have to wait uh, a couple more months uh, towards, uh, at SPI we'll present it, and towards the end of the year, we'll be bringing out uh, 120 volt uh, variants of these units as well from the markets. So here's a, uh, a render of the bottom side of the unit, uh, so you can see what kind of uh, interfaces we have. So I'll, I'll start at the top. Uh, we have the remote display connector. So if you do remove this display unit, uh, then you connect the Ethernet cable here and on the other side uh, to, the, to the display unit if you want to put, put that in a different room than the inverter. Here we have our relay contacts, which are both normally closed and normally open, depending on where you plug them in. So you can use any logic. We have the USB OTG port, uh, if, again, if you want to download data from the device. Uh, we have a lithium battery port here, which is designed specifically for use with uh, lithium batteries for communication. 
Um, and then we have a serial communication port. So if you want to communicate with a computer, for example, or a Raspberry Pi or some kind of existing uh, information system within your building, uh, you can use this port to both query and program the inverter. Then on the bottom, we have uh, all of the power connections and some, some more interfacing. We have the AC input on the top here and the AC output on the bottom. We have a resettable 40 amp AC fuse or input breaker here. So again, this is uh, resettable. So if it pops out, you can just pop it back in. Then we have uh, the parallel communication interface right here, because as you'll see later in the extensibility section, uh, we can use that to, uh, to interface with uh, multiple units. So here we have the uh, parallel communications. And here we have the uh, battery connectors. On, they're on the inside, obviously, but the cable pass through is here. So here's a, a real picture of the, uh, the connections you can make. Uh, again, you can see the AC output is here. And uh, the AC input is here. We have the PV input right here and the battery plus and minus here. The, uh, the terminals that are required here uh, the, the cable shoes uh, that you crimp around, because we obviously we need big cables here. We're dealing with uh, 100 to 200 amps of current on the, on the battery side to be able to handle those five kilowatts or 10 kilowatts for five seconds. Uh, so we basically include uh, those, those terminals inside uh, the, the packaging from the energy grid. Um, here you can see a picture of the display unit. So again, this is uh, removable. On the left here, you can see a battery charging source selector for the timer. So you can set up a basic priority scheme. You'll see later what that means. And then you can override that with this button for a certain number of hours per day. Then we have uh, various LED indications. So you can see if uh, the device is currently running in grid or in off-grid mode. You can see if uh, it's charging. And you can also see if there's an error, for example. And then on the right-hand side, we have the AC output source indicator and timer selector. So this is basically the equivalent to your battery charging uh, selector. You can override your standard settings uh, of the AC output source um, for a certain number of hours per day by using the timer. And then finally, here you have an AC output on-off switch. Now, this is not to be mistaken for a power switch for the whole device. This will really only control your AC output. Uh, so the advantage of that is if, for example, getting back to the cottage example, um, you might have a cottage which you only visit during the weekend and you're not there during the week. Well, then during the week, you would turn this off and then the inverter will still, or basically the unit, the any grid will start up automatically when the sun is shining, so during the day, and it will charge your batteries. But it will never provide any current or voltage on your AC output, so you can be sure that none of your loads are running. But like that, you can always be, be sure that even if you're not home, your battery is always kept topped up. So here we have a more detailed uh, picture of the dust filters. There's one on each side. Uh, those are easily accessible from the side. So you can see here there's a, there's a single screw hole, and they're just clipped into the side right here. And uh, the actual filter itself is rinsable in tap water. So you don't need to replace those when they, when they do get dirty. So this is a, a, an overview of what a system could look like. You can see that uh, virtually all of the components are optional. Uh, I'll get into more detail on, on what combinations make sense in the use case scenarios. But uh, for now, this will give you an overview of what kind of uh, devices or power sources you can connect to the any grid units. So the one thing that is typically not optional is your AC loads, obviously, if you don't have any loads, then there's not much use for having an inverter, typically. Um, so I didn't uh, put optional on that one. Obviously, if your loads are turned off, the, the device doesn't really care much. But uh, that's pretty much the point of an inverter is to power your loads. Then we have the, the PV input, uh, which is optional. We have the battery connection. So you can, but you don't have to connect a battery. So this is already a, a big difference between the any grid and a lot of other devices out there. And then we have a one AC input where you can connect either a public grid or you could connect uh, an AC generator of some kind, a fuel cell, et cetera. 
Uh, what's important to know here is that we have uh, one AC input. So if you do want to use more than one AC source, you can. But you need to have an external source selector. So this could be a simple relay, for example, because you don't really need to care about uh, phase shifts when switching over or being able to switch particularly quickly because as soon as the, uh, the any grid detects that there's uh, uh, a problem with the frequency or uh, that even if it's for a very short time the grid is failing, which is pretty much what will happen when you switch this over, then it will immediately switch to off-grid mode and then it will resynchronize to your new AC source and then you can, it will detect that as a new valid source and then it can use that. So basically, you do need an external switch, but it takes all of the guesswork out of quick switching and synchronization and all of those other issues. So now an explanation on all of these uh, optional uh, components. So you need to have at least one energy source, obviously. Uh, this device is there for converting from one energy source to the other and providing power where you need it to your AC loads. But you're going to have to have some kind of energy source, and obviously you can have more than one. So you're going to need to have at least one of these being uh, a solar PV connection or a public grid or some kind of an AC generator. Then, as mentioned, the battery is optional. So you don't necessarily need to have one. If you do connect a battery, then of course you use that as storage. The device can automatically act as an uninterruptible power supply simply because it switches over so quickly between uh, grid mode and off-grid mode. And in fact, when you're, when you're working between those two modes, when you're in off-grid mode, so for example, let's say uh, your priority is, uh, is to use uh, as much PV energy as you can, so you want to voluntarily disconnect from the grid when you don't need it. Well, in that case, you will literally be disconnected from the grid. Both line and neutral will be disconnected from the grid, so there's no risk of backfeeding into the grid. And for this to work well, obviously, with your existing loads, we need to have this very quick switch over time so that you don't have uh, any of your loads which, which would uh, temporarily turn off during the switch over time. So that just doesn't happen. We, we haven't met any loads so far that will not handle that 10 millisecond switch over time. Uh, for those interested, that's one half sine wave. And then uh, as an option, with the connected battery, you can feed into the grid if you like. And without the battery, uh, we, we say that a grid is required. Um, technically speaking, it's actually not. So even if you have no battery connected, you can still use uh, PV to power your loads. But of course, because now we have absolutely no buffer in the system and we have no fallback energy source if we don't have a grid connection, for example, then as soon as the PV power drops below the power of your loads, then of course the inverter can only turn off. So this is not recommended. That's why we write that a grid is required. But technically speaking, uh, it would work without a battery even and without an AC source. So obviously, the big advantage of working without a battery is that you can save that cost of investing into a battery. Or, for example, you could start off without a battery, and you might say, OK, PV has gotten uh, relatively uh, cheap as compared to maybe 20 years ago, but batteries are still quite expensive. So you can start off uh, with the AnyGrid, you can hook it up to your, your existing home, and then you can just add a battery later as they get cheaper. And then finally, if you're working without a battery, you can still obviously take advantage of your PV power. And uh, if, you, if you do have any excess energy, so if you're producing more uh, power from PV than you require for your AC loads, then it's up to you if you want to inject that into the grid or not. So there's a specific setting for that. If you're not allowed to inject into the grid, for example, then you would just leave that disabled. So now I'll move to the, uh, to the five use case idea. So use case number one, uh, this is an off-grid use case. So you can see that there's no grid connected here. Uh, we do require a battery in this case. And you're going to need either PV as an energy source or an AC generator like a genset, for example. You can start that automatically by the relay uh, described earlier. So the benefits of this kind of system is that you have a vastly simplified system as compared to your traditional inverter plus uh, charge controller plus potentially charger from the grid. So you're combining at least three uh, devices into one, and that's not to speak of the whole uh, synchronization and, and fast switching, etc. 
So you're, you're really simplifying that down into a single device. Uh, also, you have no requirement to coordinate uh, communication between multiple devices because there's no need to have a separate charge controller or a separate inverter anymore. So the only multiple devices you might have is maybe more than one AnyGrid. And in that case, the communication is baked into the devices, of course, so they can handle that between each other. So there's, no, there's nothing you need to do in terms of protocols, in terms of baud rates or fabricating cables, et cetera. So use case number two is uh, a grid-connected scenario, so an on-grid scenario with battery and PV. So you would do this, for example, uh, if you want to prioritize uh, solar for electricity cost savings, so to, to, to save money on your power bill. Or you could even do the opposite if you say that the most important, the highest priority for you is to keep your battery charged at all times for uh, the case when the grid fails, then you want to have the opposite. Then you want to prioritize the grid. You want to use the grid whenever possible, and you want to use all of the energy to, to just keep your battery topped up. That is theoretically also possible. And of course, you can have various scenarios in between the two. Uh, if it's legal in your area, you can, you can feed in as well in this scenario. Um, but it's physically impossible to activate this function by accident. Uh, you'll see later how it's activated. Uh, so the benefits here are you can uh, save electricity costs by simply prioritizing PV and just disconnecting from the grid when you don't need it. And then, again, if it's legal, you can sell any excess energy you might have uh, to, the, to the power grid if, if you have the, the contracts for that. Then use case number three. Uh, again, on grid, uh, this time we have a battery, but we have no PV. So uh, even in, in cases where you don't have access maybe to the roof because you might be in a multi-story building which is not your own, uh, you have an apartment of some sort, etc., uh, you could still use the AnyGrid uh, basically as, as just a large uninterruptible power supply. The way you would have uh, in front of just a computer, well, you can you see this as a large one which, are, which will act as a UPS for your entire home. So in this case, you benefit from the fast switching uh, between the grid and off-grid modes. And uh, you, can, you can be sure that your home is still running even if the grid fails. Obviously, in this scenario, because you have uh, the public grid as your only energy source, the system is only as good as your battery. So obviously, when, when the battery capacity is depleted, uh, then at some point, uh, the inverter will have to turn off. But it's definitely good to keep you running for uh, probably several hours even if the grid does fail. For more videos and information, go to www.focus.com. Focus, making reliable energy access possible. Anywhere, anytime, any grid.